So let's have a look at cardiac dysrhythmias. Now you may find that in your textbook or online you'll read the word arrhythmia. Now arrhythmia is a little bit of a misnomer because it means a lack of cardiac rhythm or no ca cardiac rhythm at all. So the term dysrhythmia is what we'll be using within this particular presentation and within your lecture notes and it's talking about a dysfunctional cardiac rhythm. And so we're going to look at some of the most common dysfunctional cardiac rhythms known as dysrhythmias. So before we start going into this particular lecture, make sure you've watched the previous lecture on normal ECGs and normal cardiac rhythms. And a couple of things that you should be aware of is the normal conduction pathway of the heart. That's one prerequisite for this lecture. And the other thing is that you understand what the criteria are in order to have a normal cardiac rhythm. So I'm going to bring that back up right now because it's quite important for this lecture. What boxes do we need to tick in order to have a normal cardiac rhythm? So the first point is that our heart needs to contract between 60 to 100 times a minute. So we need between 60 to 100 beats per minute in order to have one of the boxes ticked for a normal cardiac rhythm. What's the next point? Next point is that our conduction system Okay, so this is the electrical system of the heart that allows for an action potential to pass through the heart so it contracts appropriately. It should begin at the sinoatrial node. So the sinoatrial node is where the conduction should begin. The next point is that the signal should propagate along the normal conduction pathway, which means it needs to start at the SA node, like we just stated, and then go through the normal conduction pathway, which means it goes from the SA node to the atria, from the atria to the AV node, from the AV node to the bundle of Hiss, and then through the various Purkinje fibers and then from the Purkinje fibers through to the myocardium of the ventricles. So this is the normal conduction pathway and this is the way that the action potential should propagate in order for the muscle to contract appropriately. And the fourth and final point is that depolarization or conduction should occur at a normal velocity. Now what does that mean? Velocity is not speed, but it's got to do with speed per time. So distance per time, I should say, which is, in this case, we're going to say meters per second. So that means that the action potential or depolarization events should actually propagate throughout these particular components of the conduction system at their normal velocity. And their normal velocity is actually quite different from each one. For example, the normal velocity of the action potential for the atria is 1,000 meters per second and the normal velocity for the AV node is only 200 meters per second. But that's the normal velocity for those particular aspects or components of the conduction system. So what that means is we need to tick all these boxes in order for us to have a normal cardiac rhythm. If any of them are not ticked off, then we have some sort of dysfunction and this can result in a dysrhythmia. Now, what are the causes or mechanisms of these boxes not being ticked? What could actually be the cause of this? Well, there's three major causes that we like to classify these into. And if we have a look, so these are the major mechanisms of dysrhythmias. And they include, number one, they include increased automaticity. So what's that mean? Well, automaticity, automatic, you know that the heart spontaneously, or certain cells within the heart, spontaneously depolarize to send that action potential down and result in depolarization events throughout the normal conduction pathway. So that's called automaticity, spontaneous depolarization. This usually begins at the SA node, as we just stated. So what you can have is increased automaticity. So this means that those cells increase their spontaneous depolarization, so it happens more often, or it could actually happen to cells that are not usually spontaneously depolarizing. So this could be other cells within the heart. 
So that's one mechanism in which dysrhythmias uh, could occur, uh, occur by. The other one can be reentry issues. So what are we talking about reentry? Now reentry is basically when you have a particular, if we look at an area of the heart, and let's just say this is just an area of the heart which has been scarred over or just doesn't conduct any electrical impulses. When you have a signal traveling down, when it hits, when this electrical signal travels down, hits this area where a signal cannot be sent, it has to travel around. Right? And then what it does is it meets up at the other end and continues down. This is what normally happens. But if you have an area of the heart in which some scarring has occurred, for example, what's going to happen is that as this signal comes down and splits into two, one's going to stop and the other one's going to keep going down. Now usually they meet and cancel each other out, but what's happening here is that as this signal continues down like this, it also continues to move up around like that. And what happens is it creates this re-entry cycle where the signal continues to depolarize this same area. And that's what we call re-entry. Okay? That's re-entry. The third mechanism of disturbance we can have a look at is what we call triggered activity. Now, triggered activity is where particular myocardium contract, certain myocardial cells contract twice after they've only been activated or stimulated or depolarized once. Okay? Now, the most common of these as a mechanism of disturbance for cardiac arrhythmias tends to be the re-entry mechanisms. And that's probably going to be the one that we tend to focus on the most throughout this lecture. So the way I want to look at all the different types of or most common types of cardiac dysrhythmias is break them down according to their location. So as you know, if we were to take a quick look at the heart and look at the conduction system, you know that you're going to, if we highlight all the various chambers, so the atria at the top, ventricles down the bottom, that the conduction system propagates its signal up at the sinoatrial node and this then propagates its signal through the atria. Then the signal moves to the atrioventricular node, which then sends it down the bundle of Hiss, and then up through the Purkinje fibers to innervate the ventricles. So I thought that the best way for us to break this down and look at all the different types of dysrhythmias is to start at the SA node. So we'll first look at dysrhythmias of the SA node, then we'll look at dysrhythmias of the atria, then we'll look at dysrhythmias of the AV node, then we'll look at dysrhythmias of the ventricles. Okay? So that's how we're going to break it up. So let's first start with the sinoatrial node and have a look at some dysrhythmias, common dysrhythmias associated with the sinoatrial node. Now, first thing we need to talk about is if we look at the sinoatrial node, that is usually the beginning point of the conduction system. So, when that gets triggered by a depolarization event and propagates through the normal conduction system and results in a normal heart rate between 60 to 100 beats per minute, that's just what we call our sinus rhythm. So, our sinus rhythm is our normal cardiac conduction and heart rate. So a sinus rhythm, if we were to look at it on an ECG, the sinus rhythm looks a little bit like this. So you have your P wave, your QRS complex and your T wave. You know that the P wave results or is atrial depolarization, your QRS complex represents 
ventricular depolarization and your T wave represents ventricular repolarization. So this is your normal sinus rhythm and this is the normal ECG that is basically capturing all those electrical events, those depolarization, repolarization events. Let's start talking about some common dysrhythmias for SA node. Well, there's two major types. Those which increase the rate of the sinus rhythm and those that decrease the rate of the sinus rhythm. So let's first look at those that decrease the rate of the sinus rhythm. These are known as sinus bradycardias. So bradycardia tells you that it's slowing down. Okay. Now because again it's the sinoatrial node, all it's telling you is that the spontaneous depolarization events of that sinoatrial node are happening more slowly over time, which means your heart rate is slowing down. That's all sinus bradycardia is. It's this normal ECG pattern. It's a normal cardiac rhythm, except it's slowed down, which means the P to P intervals are longer or wider. So what you find with sinus bradycardia is you have your P, Q, R, S, T, P, Q, R, S, T, and you can see that that P to P interval is a lot longer than in the normal sinus rhythm. In actual fact, what you'll find is that if we look at these heartbeats, sinus bradycardia, by definition, is less than 60 beats per minute. Now, what could cause sinus bradycardia? Well, in actual fact, sinus bradycardia is found quite commonly in young, healthy individuals and also well-conditioned athletes. Think about why. Well-conditioned athletes mean that they exercise hard, their heart is strong, and it doesn't take as many contractions of the heart to provide the body or the tissues with the oxygen or blood that it needs. So well-conditioned athletes can actually have sinus bradycardia. Now these are normal conditions, non-pathological conditions in which people can have sinus bradycardia. But what are some of the pathological conditions? Well, somebody could have increased vagal tone. You know, the vagus nerve, that wandering nerve, in it comes down, one of the cranial nerves comes down, innervates the heart, tells it to slow down. So if you have increased vagal tone, it means it's stimulating the heart too much, telling it to slow down. It could also be the effect of hypoxia, uh, hypothermia. It could potentially be the effect of some drugs that an individual may be taking. And these may be common anti-dysrhythmic drugs, such as beta blockers or calcium channel blockers, for example. And it could be the drug effects of those. So they could be some particular pathological cases. Now, what do you do in cases of sinus bradycardia? Well, if it's asymptomatic, no symptoms, then the treatment option is do nothing, okay? Nothing needs to be done. What happens in individuals who are symptomatic for bradycardia. You know, this could be particularly lightheadedness, for example. They may be noticing some of these symptoms, maybe syncope or near syncope, potentially fainting. Um, what could be the result? What could be the treatment option? Well, basically, if they're symptomatic, atropine is quite common. So if symptomatic, symptomatic, if I knew how to spell, symptomatic, Atropine. Why atropine? What does atropine do? Atropine blocks the parasympathetic nervous system. Hopefully that makes sense now. Because it's a slow heart rate, and you know if you activate the parasympathetic nervous system, you activate the vagus nerve and your heart rate slows down. So atropine blocks that. So blocking the slowing down of the heart can result in an increased heart rate. So atropine can be used in cases of symptomatic sinus bradycardia. Okay, let's talk about an increased heart rate that's beginning at the sinoatrial node. So it's depolarizing too quickly. In actual fact, it's depolarizing greater than 100 beats per minute. This is known as sinus tachycardia. meaning fast heart rate originating at the sinoatrial node. And like I said, by definition, this is greater than 100 beats per minute. And because it's originating at the sinoatrial node, it's going through the normal conduction system just more quickly, which means, again, you get a normal ECG pattern. It just means that your P to P intervals are shorter this time. So in sinus 
tachycardia, you still get your P, Q, R, S, T, and then another P, Q, R, S, T very soon after. And again, this will happen a hundred times per minute in regards to beats per minute. Now, in what cases will we have sinus tachycardia? Well, most commonly sinus tachycardia is a result of physiological stress. So that means anytime somebody gets stressed out, it can result in sinus tachycardia. Now that could be many different things. That could be fear, for example, uh, that could be pain or anxiety. So in order to treat sinus tachycardia, the best option is to treat the underlying cause of the physiological stress. So treating the anxiety, the fear, pain, for example. Okay. So this is the sinolateral node originating dysrhythmias. You've got a normal sinus rhythm, not a dysrhythmia, that's normal cardiac rhythm, but you've got sinus bradycardia, which is a slow heart rate, less than 60 beats per minute, and sinus tachycardia, which is a fast heart rate, faster than 100 beats per minute. And this is what they roughly look like on an ECG strip. The next uh, one, we get, ne next lot of dysrhythmias we're gonna look at are those that originate from the atria. So, if we were to draw the heart up again, I'll draw it up over here. We spoke about sinoatrial node originating dysrhythmias, but let's say we have arrhythmias originating now at the atria. So if I were to draw up the chambers again, very roughly, we're now skipping the SA node and we have depolarization events now originating somewhere within the atria. Okay, that's the first point. So atrial originating dysrhythmias originate outside of SA node. Now what that means is once this depolarization event occurs, let's say it was to start here for example, it's going to propagate its signal in many different directions until it makes it to the AV, AV node, and then the AV node sends the signal through the rest of the normal conduction pathway. So what that means is, what type of differences should you see in an ECG for atrial originating dysrhythmias? Well, first thing is, it bypasses the SA node, which means you have absent or very abnormal looking P waves. because we know the P waves are representative of atrial depolarization originating from the sinoatrial node. Now because it's originating at some different points, so with atrial dysrhythmias, they're usually recognized as those in which are greater than 100 beats per minute. So what does that tell you? So it means that atrial dysrhythmias are usually atrial tachycardias, And like I said, that's greater than 100 beats per minute. But because it's not focusing on the P waves, it's 100 beats per minute looking at QRS complexes. Which is fine. So, atrial tachycardia is 100 and great, greater than 100 beats per minute. Now, if this action potential depolarization event originates at one focal point, such as I've drawn here, it's unsurprisingly called a focal atrial tachycardia, which means begins at one point. Or one area. But you can have atrial tachycardias, which originate from many different areas, and this is called multifocal tachycardias. And what that means is it can originate here as well, and here as well, and here as well, and here as well. And so you get all this very strange looking depolarization events where you should see the P wave. So you see some very strange, sometimes it looks inverted, sometimes it's up, sometimes it's down, and then you get normal QRS complex. And then again, you get this strange looking P waves. Okay, now multifocal, like I said, is originating at many points. 
begins at many many points in the atria. Okay. Now, that's atrial tachycardia. It's greater than 100 beats per minute. However, you can have atrial tachycardias which are a lot faster. In actual fact, atrial tachycardias, which are known as atrial flutters, and these atrial flutters are actually between 250 to 350 beats per minute. Now, these atrial flutters between 250 and 350 beats per minute, again, originating at the atria. And what you find is that this is usually due to what we call, and I spoke about it at the beginning of this lecture, re-entry mechanisms. So that means that you have your chambers. If it were to start a depolarization event here, remember I said if there's an area in which does not conduct an electrical impulse. They usually meet on the other end and they cancel each other out and then they keep propagating. But I said if there's some damaged area, some areas ischemic or some of the tissue dies off a little bit, what that means is when the signal gets sent down through an area that's scarred, for example, it results in, so let's say there's a scarred area, we start sending a signal down, one gets blocked, the other one continues to cycle around and that's called re-entry and it just keeps propagating a signal over and over and over again and keeps sending it out. Now this is a re-entry mechanism and that's usually what causes atrial flutters and that's between 250 350 beats per minute. Now if you were to have a look at an ECG of an atrial flutter it has what we call a sawtooth look to it. So you have these really weird looking P waves in the QRS complex and again these weird looking P waves in the QRS complex. Okay? So it's this sawtooth like look that you see where the P wave should be, which tells you that it's an atrial flutter. Sawtooth looking ECG. So what could cause this? Well Structural abnormalities is probably one of the most common. It could also be some sort of toxic drug effect. It can sometimes be due to digitalis toxicity as well. Um, what type of treatment options could we use for atrial flutter? Well, we could use some of the common uh, cardiac antidysrhythmic medications. That includes beta blockers, and that also includes uh, calcium channel blockers as well. Now. If this lasts too long, this could reduce the cardiac output of an individual. Why? Well, because if the heart's beating so quickly, then it doesn't give it enough time in diastole, relaxation, to fill up with enough blood to be able to push out to the rest of the body. So if it's contracting too quickly, well, cardiac output could be reduced. Now, a very interesting point you should be aware of is, because what's happening here in the atria with these atrial-based dysrhythmias, as the signal, regardless of what type of signal is being propagated here at the atria, it is, the rate limiting step is the AV node, okay? Remember, atria, I told you about normal conduction, normal velocity, usually around about 1,000 meters per second, but then we've got the AV node, which is about 200 meters a second, right? Which is basically 0.2 seconds. So, what can happen is, even though that's, contracting and depolarizing very quickly, the AV node will slow it down. And so usually the fastest you'll get with atrial flutter, the fastest conduction you'll get through the ventricles will be around about 170 beats per minute because it slows down that atrial flutter. Now, you can have atrial dysrhythmias that are actually faster than 250 to 350 beats per minute. These are called atrial fibrillation and atrial fibrillation is greater than 350 beats per minute now again it's due to 
these re-entry, multifocal re-entry mechanisms. So it's re-entry happening at different parts of the heart. That's why it's contracting so much. And it looks like a bag of worms, really. And when you look at the ECG, you don't really see much in regards to where the P wave should be. You see this chaotic mess, and then a QRS complex, and then again a chaotic mess, and then a QRS complex. Okay? So that's what we see for atrial fibrillation. And the type of treatment option you can have, again, could be some of those antidysrhythmics, beta blockers, um, calcium channel blockers, but also electrical cardioversion, okay? Electrical cardioversion. So atrial fibrillation, and again, because the AV node is the rate-limiting step, the ventricles will depolarize at a slower rate, but still quite fast, like I said, around about 170 beats per minute for the ventricular depolarization. So that's atrial fibrillation. Now again, you can have reduced cardiac output for atrial fibrillation, but these atrial events that are happening, atrial tachys, atrial flutters, atrial fibs, and you can see greater than 100, then it goes to the next stage, 250, 350, then the next stage greater than 350, they're not necessarily life-threatening. They can increase your likelihood of developing uh, clots. Why is that? Because if it's just doing this like a bag of worms, it increases the pool time for the blood and can increase the likelihood of clots developing up here in the atrium and then being pushed out to the rest of the body. That's one point. The other point is that it's not necessarily life-threatening, these atrial tachys, flutters, fibs, because... When the blood is in the atria, you know that you get contraction of the atria first, blood gets pushed into the ventricles, and the ventricles contract, pushes blood out to the rest of the body, either the lungs or the rest of the body. If the atria are contracting like a bag of worms, which you see in these cases, it's not a big issue because blood will just fall via gravity through the uh, uh, atrioventricular cusps or flaps, uh, or valves down into the ventricles. So due to, even though it's not contracted properly, enough blood will go down into the ventricles to be contracted out. The problem you get is when the ventricles start to shake, but that's when we move on to ventricular-based dysrhythmias. Now the next point we're gonna look at, we've gone sinoatrial node, we've gone to atria, we're now gonna have a look at atrioventricular node-based dysrhythmias. Okay, now, Again, we'll draw the heart up, SA node, AV node, down the bundle of Hiss, then the Purkinje fibers, okay? So we spoke about SA node, we spoke about atria, now we're at AV node. So what happens in these AV node-based dysrhythmias? Well, what we're going to focus on is something called AV node block, which is actually also known as heart block. And what this AV node block or heart block is referring to is the fact that the signal that's coming from the sinoatrial node through to the atria, okay, so the signal that's propagating down through to ultimately go to the AV node, going from the SA node through the atria to the AV node and then subsequently going down the bundle of Hiss, here at the AV node there's some sort of delay or there's some sort of abnormal change, or there's some sort of blockage, okay? So what it is, is a delay or absence of atrial depolarization propagating to the ventricles. I'll state that again. It's a delay or absence of all this atrial depolarization propagating through to the ventricles. So it's either a delay of some sort or it's not happening. Now you can break this AV node block or heart block down into three different types. You've got first degree heart block, second degree heart block, and third degree heart block. So, and they sort of progress on in severity in a way. First degree heart block is basically this. There is a delay in which this P wave, because you know that this atrial depolarization is the P wave, which then moves to this uh, ventricular depolarization, the QRS complex. 
the P wave is delayed. You know that the normal delay happening at the AV node, right, is 0.2 seconds. In actual fact, in first degree heart block, it's greater than 0.2 seconds. Okay, the delay at the AV node, which means on the ECG, what do you get for first degree heart block? You get a P wave. Usually the break is 0.2 seconds, but it's greater now than 0.2 seconds. So you get this big break between the P wave and the QRS complex. Okay, that's what it is. And then happens again, P wave, big break, QRS complex and so forth. Now what you find here is this. Because that's P, Q, R, S, T, you're getting this big break from the P to the R. Okay? Again, a big break from the P to the R, longer than normal. But what you find is that the P to P interval stays the same. So it's always going to be P to P to P to P, it's always going to stay at the same length from each other. What you get though is a widened P to R interval. This is first degree heart block. What do you do for first degree heart block? Nothing. You don't treat. Okay? Alright, what now? Let's look at second degree heart block. Second degree heart block can actually be broken down into two types. You can have what we call MOVIPS1. and MOBITS 2. Okay, what's the difference between MOBITS 1 and MOBITS 2? So, what happens again is that there's some sort of delay that's occurring, and you'll have your P wave, then you're going to have your delay, then you're going to have your QRS complex and T, then you're going to have your P wave, but then the delay gets longer. QRS complex, P wave, greater delay. And what you'll find is as these P to R, P to R gets longer and longer, which you don't see in heart block one, as the P to R gets longer and longer, at some, at some particular point, the QRS complex disappears. It just drops out. And then from this P, what are you going to get next? Is another P. And then it goes back to the normal length P to R. This is MOBITS 1, and the, you don't do any treatment for MOBITS 1. What happens for MOBITS 2? Well, there's none of this lengthening, this sequential lengthening between P to R for MOBITS 2. You just have, I'll rub this out. For MOBITS 2, you have P, QRS, T, then you have P, Q, R, S, T, and what ends up happening here is that at some point the Q, R, S complex just disappears. And so T and then P, nothing. P, Q, R, S complex. So the P to P interval remains the same, but you get a dropping of the Q, R, X complex at a particular point. This does require treatment, and the treatment for MOBITS 2 is a pacemaker. Okay? So, second degree MOBITS 1, MOBITS 2. Let's have a look at third degree heart block. Third degree heart block, what's the difference? Well, I've stated in first and second degree heart block that there's a delay from the atrial depolarization to the ventricular depolarization, which means you get a longer break between the P and R interval. That's for first degree. Second degree, again, you get this halting, but sometimes some of these atrial depolarizations don't ever even propagate into a QRS complex. So you have depolarization, then you get this break, QRS complex, depolarization, break, QRS complex, and then atrial depolarization, break, no. QRS complex, that's second degree heart block. The QRS complex intermittently sort of drops off. Third degree heart, um, heart block, what happens here is that the atrial depolarization events are not related in any way, shape, or form to the QRS complexes. 
So that means that the ventricles depolarize and contract independently of the atria. So regardless of when this is depolarizing, this will depolarize on its own, and it will depolarize in accordance with the spontaneous firing of the AV node. And the AV node, unlike the, remember the SA node, spontaneously depolarizes 60 to 100 times a minute. The, that's the SA node. The AV node will spontaneously depolarize between 30 to 55 beats per minute, which means in third degree heart block, P waves are not related to QRS complex. And therefore, ventricles depolarize, depolarize between 30 to 55 beats per minute. That's third degree heart block. And what do you need here? Pacemaker. Okay? So these are the AV node blocks. Heart block one, heart block two, heart block three. You can see that it has to do with P waves turning into QRS complexes, except it just takes a little longer. P waves turning into QRS complexes, except some of those QRS complexes don't propagate. And then P waves not associated at all with QRS complexes, and that's like a full heart block, that's third degree heart block. The next and last point we're gonna look at is ventricular-based dysrhythmias. Yes. So again, drop the heart, atria, atria, ventricle, ventricle. We spoke about those that originate the SA node, spoke about those that originate the atria, spoke about those that originate at the AV node. Now we're talking about, when we look at cardiac dysrhythmias of the ventricles, so ventricular dysrhythmias, ventricular dysrhythmias are those that originate in ventricular myocardium or the Hiss Purkinje system. That's what we're referring to. Ventricular dysrhythmias are those that originate in the ventricular myocardium, so the muscle of the ventricles, the Hiss or the Purkinje system. Two major types I want to look at. You have ventricular tachycardia. And what ventricular tachycardia is, again, it's a heart rate or ventricular contraction that's happening greater than 100 times per minute. Ventricular contraction that's happening at greater than 100 times per minute. Ventricular tachycardia. Ventricular tachycardia can move on into something that's more dangerous, which is known as ventricular fibrillation. Now, ventricular fibrillation is going to happen greater. Well, actually, what you should first look at is when we look at the ECG of ventricular tachycardia, what you find is that you have these very strange irregular ECGs, again, greater than 100 beats per minute. If you move on to ventricular fibrillation, it just looks like a mess. And that's because with ventricular fibrillation, you've got all these multifocal points that are depolarizing, and it's resulting in similar to atrial fibrillation, like that bag of worms, you're getting that at the ventricles. Now, both ventricular tachycardia and ventricular fibrillation well, that, they both result in a decreased cardiac output. Why? Because when the heart contracts the ventricles in that nice syncytium manner, so all at once contracts, pushes that blood out to the rest of the body, that can deliver that blood in an appropriate way. That's normal cardiac output, about five liters, remember? Five liters per minute. Now, if it's contracting like a bag of worms, blood doesn't squirt out properly, cardiac output is dropped, patient can result not just in lightheadedness and syncope, which is fainting, but the patient can ultimately die. 
which means ventricular tachycardia and especially ventricular fibrillation are the most deadly or dangerous types of dysrhythmias that an individual can have. Now the only treatment for ventricular fibrillation is using a defibrillation machine. So defibrillating the patient. Remember that machine with those paddles and they always say clear? Well, don't rub those paddles together. But when you use that machine, the defibrillator, you're defibrillating the patient, putting through a jolt of electricity, trying to reset the conduction system of the heart. And so ECGs look a little bit more regular for tacky, still quite an electrical chaotic mess, and ventricular fibrillation just looks like a, a total utter electrical mess when you look at it on an ECG. The loss or reduction in cardiac output can result in death for the patient. So we've just gone through the common or most common types of cardiac dysrhythmias. Please feel free, watch it again, make sure you understand all the various causes, some treatment options, manifestations, and so forth.